O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters who are washed in the blood of Jesus and made saints in the kingdom of God. Imagine yourself doing this. The alarm clock goes off for the fourth time and you realize you're going to be late for work. You get a snooze one too many times. And so you rush through your morning ritual and jump in the car and you, you realize if, if you just keep going, you'll get there on time, just in the nick of time. But as you go down the road, you notice a car broken down on the side. And the other cars on the road are just flying right on past like they don't even see them. As you get closer, you recognize the driver of the car. It's a man who has bad-mouthed you in the community and spoken very poorly of your family. But you stop. And using your own expensive resources that you have in your car, you cobble his car so it can limp to the nearest gas station. Well, you take the man to a hotel. You pay $200 to the clerk for his lodging, and, and you promise that you're going to come back in a few days and pay whatever balance on the bill for him. Does that sound like something you would do? That sounds pretty superhuman, doesn't it? Almost super Christian. Now, such extreme acts of compassion, I think, are fairly rare. But every day, you and I are confronted by the crossroads of com compassion on, on a smaller scale. For instance, you're coming out of Meyer, and you see a young mother truck struggling to get her groceries into the trunk of her car in a complete downpour of rain. And her little infant is screaming in the shopping cart, and she's trying to hold her three-year-old who's trying to squirm out of her hand so he can go run through the puddles in the middle of the parking lot. Do you stop and help? Even though you don't even have an umbrella yourself? Or you, do you just run to the car? Or what about running outside to help your neighbor find his dog who for the third time that week has escaped and run him up? Or do you finally just say, that's what he gets for having such a stupid dog? What do you do? See, we all come to these crossroads. Simple acts, random acts of kindness. Just stopping to help someone carry their load. What do we do? Yet we often find ourselves at those crossroads, don't we? Do we or don't we? And almost always, it's never as simple as, I'm bored out of my mind, I have absolutely nothing to do, I might as well stop and help that person on the side of the road. It always happens, doesn't it, when we are trying to get somewhere. And we have a choice. Am I going to be late for work, or am I going to help this person in need? Am I going to lose the time for myself or my family and give this person the time they need. We might also come to another type of crossroad of compassion. And maybe you've heard the term, it's called compassion fatigue. 
That's when we get tired of being compassionate because we've been compassionate so often or so much. Uh, think, for instance, the, the, the natural calamities or natural disasters that are, have been hitting our country lately. You start with the volcanoes in uh, Hawaii, devastating homes and neighborhoods. Then you get to the, the, the tremendous fires that are still going on. You don't hear about them much anymore on the news. Got, got a little tired of hearing about it, but they're still burning, still destroying homes. Then you move to the East Coast and the tremendous flooding that destroyed homes and communities. Now you've got to come back to the Midwest and to Wisconsin, <coughs> excuse me, where they're having tr tremendous flooding. Throw in the tornadoes and that damage they cause, and now it's hurricane season. And after a while, we just get tired of showing compassion. That's called compassion fatigue. It's another crossroad that we come to. Compassion really is just a part of our stewardship as Christians. Stewardship isn't just caring for the stuff that God has given to us, but it's also caring for the people that God has placed in this world with us. When Jesus came into this world, his compassion, his, his personal interaction with people filled his ministry. He came to, to live and endure the very things that we endure. In fact, he even came to endure the same temptations to not show compassion that we show. Or at least maybe to show just the token amount so that we can say we did something. But Jesus constantly showed compassion far beyond his teachings. Compassion that involved every aspect of people's lives. A compassion that reached not only to their, their, their need that was presented, but to the real needs. The real needs that are so often missed when we're in a hurry. Let's take this deaf mute in our text, for example. Imagine what it must have been like for that man to be both deaf and mute. He couldn't speak clearly or intelligibly. How would you ask for directions? How could you ask for help? How could you really uh, converse or talk to people? And you can imagine what he did is, you know, he, he used sign languages and gestures and tried to, you know, talk with his hands and people kind of look at him and go, huh? And pretty soon they just shrug, shake their head and walk away, right? And then if you tried to talk and just mumble, gibberish would come out. You know how cruel people can be when somebody has something different about them. And I'm sure he saw the children snicker and smile and point their fingers. Or maybe even the adults trying to hide the smile underneath their hand. And even if they did understand him, how could they talk back to him? He was deaf. And so he probably just receded back deeper and deeper and deeper into that dark hole of isolation and loneliness. That same kind of a hole that you and I can crawl into when when we're in need and maybe embarrassed by our needs. We don't want other people to know. And maybe we even try and justify it by saying they don't care or nobody would understand. And we, we, we recede, we hide in these dark, dark holes alone. And people don't show us compassion. 
where we don't show them compassion. Because we're just in too much of a hurry. To rush, rush down that road that we're traveling. Well, Jesus, in a way that this man could relate to, took him aside and he took his fingers and put them in the man's ears. He knew, the man knew what he was thinking, what Jesus was saying. And then he spit and he touched the man's tongue. And then looking up to heaven, he took a deep sigh, a sigh of sadness at the corruption of the beautiful creation that God had made. The beautiful creation that God had wanted every human being to ever enjoy. He sighed in sadness at how sin corrupted that and spoiled it. And he said, Ephatha, be open. And immediately the man's ears were opened and he could hear again. His tongue was loosed and he could speak clearly. He could hear the gasps of the crowd uh, as they realized the miracle that just happened in front of their eyes. He could hear the shouts of the people praising God. And then he could join them in praising God clearly, maybe for the first time in his life. And he could lift his voice heavenward, no longer isolated, no longer alone, no longer separated. Jesus' compassion reached even beyond that physical need because Jesus went to the cross. He went to the cross for the reason for all of these hardships and problems our sin. Jesus' love was not in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. He put his compassion where his words were. And Peter and John did the same thing as they followed Jesus' example. And they found that lame man by the temple. And they reached out to him in compassion. Just like Jesus did to meet this man's needs. But Jesus' compassion doesn't wear thin. He doesn't suffer from compassion fatigue. And thank God he does it, right? Because it would get pretty tiring for us to keep having to intercede with God for the same sins that you and I commit again and again and again, for our lack of compassion again and again and again, and our excuse making again and again. And he never grows tired of that, but he always entreats his heavenly Father, forgive them for my sake. See them with my perfect compassion. We have to admit, we don't have perfect compassion, do we? You know, and it's not always that we don't show compassion, but is it to the level of Jesus' selflessness? And don't we often try and set limits on our compassion? It's the who. Uh, we want to determine the who gets it, the what do they get, when do they get, how much they get. We want all of that. And we try and justify our lack of compassion by saying, oh, they were just wasted anyway. Or they don't deserve it, they're lazy. It's interesting that Jesus never said that about anybody that's recorded in the Gospels. But he met them where they were. And he had compassion on them. If you read the book of Acts, you find out how the early Christian church treated each other. And uh, Luke writes, No one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. As far as the basic needs were concerned, they believed that the poor should be no poorer than the rich among them, and the rich should be no richer than the poorest among them. 
They shared and shared a lot. But Jesus wasn't done with this man because there was a, a deeper need than, that this man had. It was the need that actually was the cause of his muteness and his deafness. It's sin. Now, it's not a particular sin. You know, we, we, we like to try and draw a straight line between a certain sin and a certain uh, problem or trouble. Oh, because he did this, now God is getting him by doing that. And we can't always do that. Sometimes we can, but usually we can't. Sin in general. Sin is corrupting. Sin is destroying. Sin is devastating God's creation. It is the fundamental cause of all needs of people, but regardless of whatever that need is. Because in the perfect Eden, there were no needs. God had supplied it all perfectly. In this fallen world, we're full of needs. And Jesus knew that he needed to address that real need of this man, and that was his forgiveness. That was his Savior. See, Jesus came into the world to do that very thing, to fix what you and I cannot fix. Jesus came into this world to, to be our Savior. It's God himself dying on that cross. When that crowd saw what Jesus had done, they said, He does everything well. They only knew the half of it. Because Jesus would do the most important thing, not just well, but perfectly. He would pay for every single sin. He paid for your sins. Every single one of them, and mine. Every single sin of this world. For all the times we think we're just too busy, to show compassion. Too busy that we go down that wrong crossroad of thinking just of ourselves, or at least thinking of somebody else we'd rather help than our worst enemy. But see, Jesus came and had compassion on his enemies, didn't he? And he prayed for each one of us Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus lived for you. He died for you. He rose again for you and He will come back again for you to, in compassion, to take you out of this world full of needs and troubles and problems and take you to a place where there will be no more needs ever again. Jesus knew this man's real need. And what a profound impact it must have had. I can only imagine that this deaf mute, who could now hear and speak clearly, was the loudest singer in that crowd, praising God. And he was listening to the chorus of voices, like the man that Peter and John healed, jumping and shouting and praising God in the temple. This man's life was different because God had shown him compassion. Our acts of compassion, my friends, are never done until we deal with that person's real need, the need for Jesus. Giving him a bag of groceries is wonderful. But what good does that do if their soul goes to hell? Being nice to someone is wonderful. But what good does that do if you aren't a friend to show them their Savior? And it doesn't have to be some long, drawn-out uh, explanation of your whole faith. But just let them know the reason for the hope you have, the love you have. The love of Jesus Christ flowing from His heart into yours and your heart 
into theirs. And God will work in His mysterious ways to create a faith, to save a soul, to rescue someone who will know their needs if they're met. If we want to be used by God, that's got to be our focus. That's got to be our focus in life. To, to be ready and willing whenever we are prompted to, to open our hearts. Not in a sense of obligation and duty and requirement, but because God has put on us a burden of love for other people. That kind of compassion doesn't come because we try and work at it. It comes by focusing on our compassion of God. The God who draws us closer to Him through word and sacrament. The God who comes into our mind and changes our thoughts, our attitudes, our feelings, and fills us with an indescribable love and a, 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 fathom, a, a bottomless love. His love. And when we see people in need and we reach out to them, let's come up alongside of them and say, let me help you carry your burden. See, that's really what the word compassion means. It doesn't mean take away their burden, but it means help them carry it. Sometimes putting it on your own shoulders. Sometimes putting your arm around their shoulders to help them carry it. And in that way, we go down the right road on that crossroad, the road of compassion, our Savior's compassion. Amen. Please stand. <clears throat> And now may the peace of Jesus Christ, who had compassion on us, keep our hearts and minds in saving faith. Amen.